I'm Lucille Pilling. Welcome to our symposium on uh, our panel, rather, on building and promoting sustainability within. We have three really dynamic panelists um, who will be talking about how their corporations susp uh, promote sustainability within their firms. We're particularly looking at how they uh, promote the intrapreneurs, as employees are called and uh, develop the projects that really meet the three pillars of, of social corporate responsibility, the environment, our particular focus with the sustainability, but also the social and the economic needs. Um, I'm not going to go into bio biographies. They're, they're printed in, in your brochures and they're online. Um, but I will introduce Linda Dunn, who is the Vice President of Supply Chain and Analysis for HMS Host Corporation, Jennifer Lake, who's the Director of for the Institute for Building Efficiency, Johnson Controls, and Rick Martella, Vice President Corporate Affairs for RMARC. And we also thank uh, Lauren for helping organize this um, panel and she will be monitoring twi Twitter as questions begin to come in. We're going to do our best to do, we're going to do about five minutes intro on what each firm is doing and then um, a a one general discussion question and then open it up for questions from the audience which is always the most important part. And depending on how much time we have, I'm going to ma I'm, I'm, my goal all along has been 15 to 20 minutes for that piece. So I will keep it tight and um, I'll ask Linda to start. Okay. Thanks, Lucille. Um, as Lucille stated, um, I'm Vice President of Supply Chain Analysis for HMS Host. And basically, our business is about um, retail and dining, um, mainly in airports, travel plazas, and also some malls. So it's, a, it's a, not a complicated business in a lot of ways, but the venues that we're, on, that we're in make it a little more complicated. Um, we have the end-to-end -end consumers that we have to deal with, and we talk about sustainability. Uh, we have to factor them in. And then we also have business-to-business, because -business, the type of business we're in is a contract-based business, where we actually have to compete and win bids to be able to then get the lease space to operate in. So we may operate some of our own concepts, like uh, chow or beau de bonds, a wine concept. Um, but we also are franchisees of other brands. We franchise Starbucks. Um, California Pizza Kitchen and 100 brands. Uh, so it's complex in that way and lots of different brands, lots of different players. It's not one box that we deal with when we look at sustainability. Um, and as far as my role, I, I'm focused on supply chain, which is everything from, you know, the beginning of what products do we need to getting them in the door in the unit. Um, I also have responsibility for revenue management, which is really um, the pricing for the products, the profitability for the products, what things sell, and then also sustainability. So that really comes into play in supply chain when you look at that. There's a pretty close link there. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, let's go on to you next. Okay. Great. So I'm Jennifer Lakey. I'm the director of the Institute for Building Efficiency at Johnson Controls. And what the Institute does is a thought leadership platform. So I work for a company that has three major businesses. And one is an automobile interiors business. Uh, the second is a battery technology business. So we manufacture the batteries that are in your cars. Uh, and we're ma manufacturing lithium ion batteries in a new plant in Michigan as well to prove uh, out the technology for electric vehicles. And then the business that I'm in, which is the, uh, the building efficiency business. And the thought leadership platform that I run uh, is an effort, a new kind of innovative effort to try and take what we're learning in the private sector markets and be able to engage with stakeholders and customers and policymakers who are interested in accelerating the deployment of energy efficiency technologies, but may or may not understand how the markets work. And so what I try to do is translate the business experience to consumers and to other organizations and groups who have an interest in, for their sustainability purposes, in succeeding and improving the efficiency of the built environment and mostly in commercial buildings. So I can tell you a little bit more about how I do that, what I do, and how those challenges emerge. Uh, but let me say that, that one of the 10 
major sustainability mar markers for our business is sustainability. So it's innovation, it's integrity, uh, it's corporate, it's social value, and it's uh, employee engagement, um, as well as shareholder value. So in, in the way that we judge our business as a whole, sustainability is one of those things we believe we bring to the table sustainability solutions in all of our major markets. Rick? Okay. Uh, I'm Rick Martell. I'm with a company called Aramark. We've been around for 75 years. Um, we have about 250,000 employees. We do three major things. We do food and retail, we do facilities, and we do uniforms. And we do those things in lots of places, like um, universities. So the, the dining experience here is one that we could Rep <laughs> we could, if you'd let us, replicate um, thousands of universities, thousands of hospitals, stadiums, arenas. Um, we do the food service for the Olympics. So those three major service sectors into uh, many different markets. Prisons, hopefully none of you will ever be fed by us in a prison, but um, if you do end up there, we might. Um, so we have uh, 250,000 jobs. Um, about 25 of them are uh, related to the theme of responsibility, whether it's community involvement, um, whether it's environmental stewardship. I'd be glad to talk about that later on, um, how you can get one of those jobs. Or um, I think one of, one of the things that we try to do is figure out how we put responsibility in everybody's job, all 250,000. So I started out in facilities as a supervisor, and so I've had um, almost all the jobs in a 20-some year career with Aramark. So I didn't start out um, in public affairs, which is the part um, that my group uh, is responsible for, um, which includes community environmental stewardship, um, health and wellness, government relations, supplier diversity, things like that. Um, and ultimately, Aramark is a company that we try to capitalize on our reach. So if you imagine that we touch tens of millions of people, students and consumers every day. Um, ultimately, we're kind of scale busters, so we take very simple things um, as it pertains to responsibility and we try to bring them to scale very quickly. So if you can imagine, we create a recycling program um, with the FDA, um, or I'm sorry, the EPA um, in a school, we can bring that to 100 other schools rather quickly. So we're all about scale. We're all about taking pretty simple things to scale. Um, and that's us. Great. The, uh, we had a telephone conversation before this so we could kind of, one, get to know each other, and two, work on a discussion question that we thought would engage all of you and, and produce some interesting questions. So the question that's being pro pro proposed to the panel to discuss is how does your company enable new employees to be involved in sustainability? Okay, I can start. Um, first of all, the way every company addresses sustainability differently, and there isn't one model. Um, at our company, uh, we really address it in three ways. One is a centralized approach. And my role is that I head up a cross-functional team. It has all the major corporate department heads on it and operators on it. And we look at initiatives, we look at what priorities we have, we set the goals, um, and develop those recommendations for executive staff approval. So that's a very centralized approach as to what do we want to focus on, um, how are we going to achieve the goals, and, and what kind of time frames. Um, then we have a decentralized kind of approach, which is um, we have a lot of operations. Um, so when you look at it, it's an opportunity for a little bit of entrepreneurship within those operations. And you have regionality related to sustainability. So we have um, the airport in Portland. It is a very green city in Portland. Uh, just about everything there that you can do that's sustainable, that city wants to do. And we're participating as a partner with them. And then we have other places in the country where we're really pulling, um, we call them our landlords or authorities that we work with at the airports or toll roads along, saying, look, you can do this. Um, so that sort of decentralized some of the efforts when it's um, the general manager and the staff and the operations there trying to come up with programs that they know can be implemented, but they maybe need a little more participation from the authority that's there. Um, so, and then the third way that 
that um, we've really focused on sustainability, sometimes through the concepts and the products that we offer. So um, we just opened in Chicago a celebrity chef, Rick Bayless, and a lot of sustainable elements, not only in the build, as far as um, reclaimed wood and, and um, low vote paint and different things that are sustainable, but also some of the foods being organic, natural, a whole focus on that. So we bring it to life that way as well. And when you look at a new employee, what's their role? Well, there's lots of different places that they could play a role when you look at those three areas. Um, what we have built is an intranet site um, that the employees can go to, to um, and we're really launching this, I would say, um, but for them to get better information about sustainability within the company, a sort of case studies and some of the best practices, and also an email site that they can go to to give suggestions. So when you look at a new employee, um, there's a couple ways they can be involved. One, their function may be very naturally involved. So the last two designers we hired are both LEED certified. And I think if you're in design and construction today, you're going to need to be LEED certified uh, to be hired. Uh, so that's one way that you want to make sure that you have those credentials. If you're an operations person, maybe that's not your lead role, but you're doing a lot with sustainability. And I think the key for the employees is to show interest that they want to be on this. Look for committees like our activities committee corporately that does a lot of programs. And then look for opportunities like we have champions at each operations. And we don't select them based on role. We select them based on interest. So I don't want someone because their title says uh, that maybe they should be the person in charge of sustainability. I want the person who has interest to be that champion at that location. So showing that interest is a way that an employee can participate, as well as giving their suggestions. So, Thank you. I, I teach corporate social responsibility. One of the things that, I, that I'm always asked is, how do I get a job in this? My response almost invariably is, find the corporation you want to be, be working with and be active and visible. You've just yeah. confirmed that. <laughs> Uh, Jennifer? Um, I'm going to highlight a couple of things that I think are, are interesting approaches that Johnson Controls has taken in the building efficiency business. Um, the first is that there's been a huge emphasis over the course of the last couple of years coming out of the recession around how sustainability will drive business growth, um, drive business value, and how does it drive innovation. And so one in the effort that we take, took on this last year was a real focus on innovation. The innovation side of sustainability is really important because what we believe we do is provide sustainability solutions in the building space. Uh, but it's not the only thing that our customers are looking for. So they're clearly looking for the best technologies. They're clearly looking for the most productive spaces for their employees. And they're clearly looking for the lowest operating cost possible. So you, you take this sort of look at technology as an enabler and you say we've got a lot of really good engineers that are coming on board that are thinking about what they are going to do in the building technology space. How do you tap that kind of innovation to create the change, to create the new products and the innovation, innovative approaches that we could roll out in our business? So we had this competition called What Would Warren Do? And Warren Johnson was the founder of Johnson Controls. He was the person who, who developed the pneumatic thermostat the first time that anybody had figured out how are you going to measure the temperature in a room was Warren Johnson with the pneumatic thermostat. We've come a long way since then, but the idea of how do you, how do you solve for something that's innovation around sustainability. We had entries from a lot of very new employees, a lot of interest in what their entrepreneurial ideas were and how they could solve problems. There were a lot of some interesting um, links between sustainability problems that were above and beyond the things we were doing in many cases already. There were people who were interested in the connection between water and energy and being able to display that on dashboards differently. Um, so there was a whole bunch of stuff that we, we looked at through that innovation approach. Um, the second thing is around corporate social responsibility and the ability for employees to engage in their communities on projects that they wanted to go out. So we have a, what's called a Blue Sky Involve program and it allows communities um, and, and employees to find ways to match up needs and to be able to support um, community uh, activism in the community by our employees. Um, and then the third example that I wanted to offer is just um, around one of the things that we, in our, in our tenure marker, which is around integrity and um, being part of the communities, being part of the process and, and operating with integrity every day. And every new employee who comes into Johnson Controls, uh, their first training 
uh, requirement, because we have a whole series of training requirements on how you operate within Johnson Controls. And the first one is on integrity. It's called Integrity Every Day. And it walks you through situations and circumstances where you're, you're put into situations um, where you have to make a decision about how you're going to act in those circumstances. And I think um, acting with, in transparent manner and acting ethically and, and being clear about what's appropriate and not appropriate is a part of the sustainability challenge that we all face. And I think that transparency piece um, is reinforced through training like this Integrity Every Day program. So new employees have an opportunity to think about sustainability in their jobs, but not just from the perspective of, you know, how am I recycling this, but how is my decision making impacted? How am I impacting my community? How am I thinking about my community? And how do I get some of my best ideas into this race for sustainable development? Thank you. Rick, you've got a lot of stories yeah, to tell. Yeah, well, they, they <laughs> took all the good stuff. So um, <laughs> it, it, it's a big challenge. So behind the screen of companies, companies that are large employers, I mean, this is one of the big things we try to figure out, right? So this thing, I call it responsibility. Some people call it sustainability. There's a premium that's paid for, it, right, by consumers when they buy products, and everything has every kind of logo where it's from, fair trade, organic, all that kind of stuff. And and we know as companies that consumers are willing to pay a premium for responsible products and services. I, I think we also think that with the new generation workforce, you, um, there's a premium um, that's attached um, in terms of identifying companies where you go, where, where you want to work. And so in some ways, the responsibility premium is also um, one that will impact employee acquisition and um, retention as well. And so I think we're all trying to figure this thing out. Um, and so I, I won't repeat, but we, we have programs, community-based programs around things like nutrition and wellness for our chefs and dietitians um, to kind of be involved in that demonstrate their skills because that's another thing for companies is you have to stay within your core. So having a bunch of chefs you know, sitting at the 18th hole of a golf outing is really not um, staying within your core. And so, you know, much like uh, these companies, you know, we try to find ways to tap into our resources. Um, you, you know, I, I talked a little bit before about trying to figure out ways to inculcate responsibility in all jobs, right? Because everybody wants to be part of something bigger. I think we heard it in the keynote. And so the question that I, you know, what keeps me up at night is, how do we make the job description of an information technology person um, have more responsibility or more ways that they can be involved in something bigger? And so that's something that we, we talk about a lot. As a matter of fact, we just launched an internship program where we had about a dozen environmental uh, sustainability interns that will go out and develop programs. And that's 12 people that have a responsible job. but. We sat across from our CIO and our CFO and a whole bunch of people, um, you know, a bunch of interns right out, of, right out of school and a bunch of leaders within the company and said, you know, what do you expect um, and, and how will that impact the job description for someone in finance, for an attorney, someone in IT going forward? And so that's the really big, hairy, hard to figure out conversation that I think um, I'm sure surely all of us are trying to figure out. How does this premium, this focus on responsibility change um, jobs, um, not people, but jobs um, in companies? Um, there's a recent statistic showing that, uh, I think it was IBM Global, no, I can't remember my source completely, but what stands out is that um, it was comparing millennials to the uh, corporate suite um, and focused on sustainability. And the millennials saw it as 72% of importance. The sustainability part was 72% important in the message, and the um, corporate suite was closer to 12%. Yeah. So I'm glad to hear that you put everybody around the same table. Yeah. And it's part of why we're here tonight. But the, uh, there's, there's another study from Boston College that says that people that have an interest in and or end up in responsible jobs and companies, that's the most effective way to create the leaders of tomorrow, CEOs, exactly. right? Because you get privy into all aspects of the company. 
um, you're exposed to a whole bunch of external stakeholders, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, there's a disconnect there, right? And so there's going to be a, a, probably a change out in terms of the leaders and companies. And we know that there'll be people that have an interest or a passion for sustainability. And so the question is, you know, how do we facilitate that? You know, what are we doing within our company, within our systems to kind of prepare for that? So. Good segue into questions. Go ahead. Uh, so you guys kind of talked about how being at higher points in your firm and trying to reach down to the new hires to get ideas. How about being at a new higher level and trying to push ideas to the top? Um, you know, professional entry to work for it seems very different. So the confidence respect, uh, you know, I have this idea. So what kind of things can you do to gain the confidence? And then how do you get the ball rolling? So how is a new employee be heard? get the confidence and, and get the visibility to have his or her idea heard? Ideas? I, I can share a couple thoughts. First of all, it's the same way you get any idea across as a new employee is learn your business. Um, understand how your company makes money. And then understand how your idea fits into that. Um, because ultimately, if you suggest something that couldn't even practically be executed, it will be an issue. So you, you need to really try to see how can I learn about my business, even if I'm in IT or I'm in a certain area of design construction, know the business from a more holistic standpoint. You know, that well-roundedness helps get the respect. Um, and then the second is look for vehicles within the organization. So again, we have a mailbox that can be done in our employee communication. We give key contacts so people can share an idea. And then send it up the ladder too. You have a supervisor. Um, they want to have good ideas that come out of their department. Learn how to make your boss look good is always one of those things. So, you know, suggest a good idea and say, you know, I really think this could work and why. You know, how does it make, what's the business proposition around it? How does it make, give you a better competitive edge doing the sustainable effort? Um, that's the way to get noticed and to get your ideas noticed. Any other comments? Uh, I, I, just one, I think mentorship is incredibly important okay. and the people that I've seen that are the most successful are those that go out of their way to figure out what skills they need to work on and find people to help them learn those skills. And, and I think this applies more broadly, but I think people who have really good ideas also have to um, recognize what processes and approaches are useful vehicles to do it, to getting those ideas um, more supported. And uh, so I, I think that people who are good at building communities around ideas are generally really effective. And often that requires that you spend the time getting to know people inside a company. Um, one of the things that I'm fairly new to Johnson Controls, I've been there 15 months, and one of the things I've been so impressed by is how accessible everybody is. The, you can come in at a low level, you can come in at a high level, no matter what. If somebody says, I need 20 minutes of your time, I want to introduce myself to you, I want to hear about what you do, and I want to be able to, you know, to get to, to build a relationship with you, I have never had anybody, you know, whether it's me on the one end or somebody else on the other end, uh, say, no, I don't have time for that. If people really matter, and if you can make those relationships work, you can, build, you can go a long way in, in influencing other people with your ideas. There's one other piece to that, and that's to get a groundswell started, not just individually, but find some other people that are like-minded and move it up that way. Yes? Rick, you've got a broad background in this. You want to try that one? Yeah. Well, um, you know, our probably all of our company we operate on, you know, five to seven percent margin. So there's, you know, there's an incredible demand for execution and flawless execution. I think is the term that we use. Um, it depends on what your definition of reinvestment is. We create a, a, a fund of money that we invest in some social instrument or something, or is it, you know, 
investing um, in community programs that help build the uh, local capacity because I think all of our companies do that um, and you know it's funny with this economic downturn a few years ago all you heard was up oh, they're the first to go all the philanthropy all the community investment programs and all that and I I think to the credit of a lot of companies is I don't think that happened I mean um, and and why didn't that happen you know part of it is because it's very important for clients and for employees and whatnot but for whatever reason it didn't happen so the the answer is that we are we are making uh, and we are reinvesting in, in our communities and in programs. The trick is to figure out ways that you can invest in programs like that that create more jobs, um, that create more, uh, a stronger company, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I think companies and nonprofits and um, all kinds of organizations are trying to figure out how to do that more productively. There is also the model, such as Google, that started out from the, from the onset saying we are going to skim off X percent and it will go. But that's that's a new model, <laughs> but, and, and it depends on the on, on the industry. As Rick yes. said, their their industry has a very tight margin. In the back. That one. Uh, well, I can share and say um, when you look at the projects that we're actually doing, we don't follow those exact principles um, that, that you mentioned, but what we are doing is each project now, um, we're developing strategies on how to minimize the impact. So um, how do we not, when we build, just have construction waste? So there's actually an eye to each part of our business. Um, it may not be this percent and exact the measurement piece is exactly and that requires a lot of resource around it and I always say I'd rather spend my money doing than reporting and that that's just my my um, nature to do action as opposed to just the reporting piece but what we are doing around each project and it's important it's important to our end consumers but even more so the authorities because we're with government authorities is how do we minimize the waste from here can we use reclaimed materials? Um, so we're going through each project, the design construction process, as I said, um, you know, the two new designers are, are both LEED certified. We're looking at every aspect of that, but it, it's not, um, um, it's very, very broad, all the areas that you can have an impact. I know I sat down with one of them and they're like, well, you know, do our chemical closets have, you know, separate ventilation? So there's not an employee impact. I'm like. That's a great question, <laughs> and I'm glad you're here to start looking at it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a progress. It's not, oh, I'm done, and I'm reporting, and great, here's where we are. It really is a progress of keep finding new areas to attack. And on each project, we're getting better and better and better at implementing those items. Other I'll add just two, two um, thoughts are, that are not just exclusive to Johnson Controls. I mean, the, 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 the question is a good one, which is how do we steer investment into outcomes that we believe create sustainability? And, you know, frankly, I would wish that there was a whole lot more institutional investment in energy efficiency because that's a great way to get a guaranteed return on your, on your investment over time through the savings associated with those, those investments. Um, so uh, on the, on the, strictly speaking from a purely business perspective, it'd be great if we saw more people investing with their sustainability hats on um, broadly. The, the, the flip side is the market has to create opportunities in that space. Um, and if you're, uh, if you're sitting in, the, in, a, in a company and you're saying, do I invest in something that is a top line opportunity, high risk, high return, 
uh, that may or may not pay out on sustainability, or do I invest in something that's got a lower rate of return and produces a great sustainability outcome? That's how people view energy efficiency right now, right? They say energy efficiency is a bottom line topic. It's not a top line investment. And that's the mindset we have to change, right? What we want is a portfolio. What you want is a balance. And you can optimize your sustainability outcomes and optimize your return on investments by thinking very smart about how you place those bets. And Johnson Controls does that. We invest in our own operations. We invest in our own facilities to try and optimize their operational efficiencies. And then we're looking for those new business opportunities as well. And Johnson & Johnson is another company that I would I would argue has been very smart in this space. They literally put money aside for renewables. They put money aside. They have an internal fund that actually funds uh, the investment in operational energy efficiency and renewables. Um, so that's one model. Um, I think that there are a lot of different ways you can get at this. We, we do similar things with a sustainability scorecard where we measure on the operational level a whole variety of things. Getting into uh, the questions associated with the top line, bottom line is a really interesting conversation and, and how you put together and blend a portfolio um, is something that I think deserves a lot more attention. So I think your question is well-timed and well-put. You've been sitting there for a while. Incentive systems for employees or for? How do you go about utilizing, motivating employees to utilize but more a more sustainable approach? That's the question? Well, in our business, some of our executives' uh, bonuses are in fact, reflective of whether or not they've met, we've met our uh, our sustainability goals. So we have a greenhouse gas emissions goal. If we if we're significantly off of that, that goes straight up to our CEO, who takes a hit on his bonus as a result of the fact that we missed our own targets. So some of it really is very direct. In other ways, it's more indirect. But I would say that's one example of where you know we really are. We walk the talk and we say we're it, just as we if we don't make our performance in our in our financial performance. We don't make our performance on environmental performance. Both have consequences for senior executives. Is that built into yours as well, Rick? Um, in some business units, yes. In others, no. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I, I think as I mentioned before, I think companies are trying to figure that out. You know, how can we incent the right behaviors? Because, um, you know, for companies like our, we have a phrase: we live in other people's homes, right? And so we live in stadiums and hospitals and all that. And there's there's never one solution. Um, that we can deploy across our client base. So I, I, I think I think one of the things that we do is we arm our managers to be solutions providers. And I think that I'd like to think that our people see themselves as being armed with, you know, a number of potential solutions. So whether it's a hospital or a stadium, there's probably not anything in the world of environmental sustainability that we don't do somewhere. And so if we can arm them with the ability to, to kind of go in um, and offer programs around consumer education all the way up, you know, composting and recycling and, you know, um, carbon footprinting and, and local and organics and all that kind of stuff, I think for our managers it makes them feel really, really good and really, really proud that they can make an impact. And so it's not a financial incentive, but um, when, when what we find is when we arm our people with the skills to kind of be able to go into a university or a hospital and make them able to achieve their outcomes around sustainability, that people feel good, we get better employees, they feel empowered, and they also feel part of something bigger. So. Thank you. Uh, you're next. Okay, go ahead. I'm next. Yeah. Industry yardstick 
there are a couple of standardized approaches. I mean, the, the um, Global Reporting Initiative is one of the tools that most of our companies are using uh, where we will report in a common format. We use uh, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which was developed by the World Resources Institute for a common methodology for calculating our greenhouse gas emissions footprints. Um, there's the Carbon Disclosure Project, which has, again, a series of questions that many of the Fortune 500 companies will respond to in terms of the types of emissions that we have, where they come from, and how we're managing them. So there are, in fact, a number of different um, frameworks. Uh, underwriter laboratories is looking at a, developing a, an environmental um, approach similar to a quality management approach. So there's a bunch of tools out there. International Standards Organization, ISO, is another one. That's, they, they created qual common quality metrics. Uh, they've cr created common environmental metrics for environmental management. And now they're looking at energy management as another layer of uh, common approaches so that you can standardize the companies. Uh, uh, use of and uh, methodologies. Yeah. And you're also seeing um, different industries coming together and developing metrics, which then allows some cross comparison, such as the, the uh, beverage industry, mm -hmm. the extraction industry, different associations are agreeing on a universal standard. You're correct in asking about the metrics, it's, it's, it's been very sticky, but we're getting there. Yeah, and to your point on organizations, I know for food and beverage, we have the National Restaurant Association, and they've developed the Conserve Organization, and so we just agreed to participate in their um, food court sustainability initiative for zero waste, but the point behind it is to develop best practices to share with others, so we're not just trying to figure it out ourselves, and we do love it to cross, but we want to help other companies as well um, learn from things that we may do. So I think what's missing sometimes are those best practices platforms. Um, you have the measurement, you can say you've done this, and those, we, we are a subsidiary of Autogrill, SPA, so we report in uh, to them on those initiatives, but what's not out there enough is third-party independent information um, that's understandable, <laughs> and also these forums to, to really share collectively best practices so you're moving ahead as an industry. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would say that um, this theme of responsibility sustainability has, is one that has brought together for me the ability to kind of talk to competitors and peers mm -hmm. and you know it's, it's interesting that for the, for the first time for many years for me it's okay for us to kind of talk about um, programs that better support the communities where we live and operate and and that's kind of cool um, it's kind of cool that I think organizations have said that look you know competitive advantage a lasts for about a week right um, and secondly is no one should keep a trade secret about a program that helps a community and so um, I think it's kind of cool that within you know our industry and I think other industries that has kind of created a very, very fertile ground for companies to collaborate. Uh, blue shirt, I think that's our last question. Let me see if I can. There's a vertical versus horizontal uh, management structure, and the other piece to it is um, you know, the, largest that stand in your way is the largest obstacle that stands in your way well, to make things more sustainable. Uh, can I Go take the that. second first? <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we talk, we throw around terms like materiality and impact, and I, I, I think that there's been so much priority in the recent past attached to responsibility by consumers, by clients, by companies, by everybody, and we're still trying to figure out what that means. And so consumers want to be involved, they want to protect the environment, they want to do these things. I don't think we've gotten to how it's supposed to happen. and so. An obstacle for us is to really kind of get to practical solutions. And so, um, 
I think that some things that will be incredibly boring and not very visible or sexy and, and whatnot are the paths, the most effective paths to impact. So things like consumer education. So when you think about us, um, is really how scalable material is it to do things like, you know, create a, an alternative energy plant, <laughs> you know, to power our kitchens at a university it's probably more impactful for us to do something incredibly boring like basic consumer education because we reach, you know, 100 million students a year. And, and to convince um, everybody that that's more material, more impactful, it's not going to be sexy, it's not going to have bells and whistles is really a hard thing to do because I think people are looking for out of the box, home swinging for the fences kinds of things, and I think that that's probably a little bit of a disconnect. And then this, the first part about the, for us it's not so much the verticality of the structure, it's, if it's a market structure for us. So in places like higher education, we tend to find a lot of innovation, um, a lot of more advanced states with clients, and by default us. Um, in other verticals, other markets, um, not so. And so that's one of the things that we can do is kind of cross-pollinate vertical markets. Um, and so we find that we bring a lot of best practice, especially around environmental sustainability from higher education and kind of populate some of our other markets with it, so. Other uh, thoughts? Yeah, on barriers, you know, um, being in airport space for us is a huge issue. We're trying to do a lot more recycling and to have a physical separate container sometimes when your restaurant is literally uh, one quarter of the size of uh, the back of house or kitchen than you might have at a street side. It, you know, <laughs> the people already on top of each other. Space is a big issue. We were looking at compactors, and I'm like, these things are huge. They're never going to fit in some of these spaces. So that's where the innovation comes in. But I think that um, for us, space is a major issue. Um, the lack of good third-party data, you get a lot of vendor data. Um, th there needs to be more of the organizations really being able to say cradle to grave is this more sustainable rather than taking a piece and spinning it to you and saying it's sustainable. So that better third-party data is sometimes an obstacle as well. Yeah, I mean, just um, a couple of uh, other quick thoughts. The, the, one of the things just from the perspective of how do you keep a, a, an organization, a company, um, non-siloed from, from where, where there may be pockets of really good innovation and sustainability. And one of the things that Johns Controls does is it just moves people around a lot. I was, I was remarking as your career, you were describing your career path. In fact, part of what you do is you just constantly are shifting. I and mean, people in Johns Controls, every couple of years, you're moved to another unit and you're with different people and you have to rebuild and rethink um, and constantly innovate and sustainability practices and best practices get, um, get built that way. And we have vertical markets like hospitals and schools, K-12, universities. Um, we do building efficiency in all of those different areas and sometimes you find out that it turns out that, you know, we have this great University of Hawaii contract that if we really knew, the rest of us all knew that they had done X, Y, and Z projects at the University of Hawaii, boy, wouldn't it be great to implement those at the hospital, you know, in Milwaukee or whatever that is. And you do have to constantly be looking for those kinds of best practices even within your own organizations because you end up in siloed units. Um, the one other thing that I'll say is that I do a survey of the market on energy efficiency every year. And this is a, uh, it's called the Energy Efficiency Indicator. It's global, and we go in and we ask decision makers, people who have authority over investments and, um, and the operations of their facilities, what they're seeking in the market. And the four big barriers that come out of that study that they cite are really around transaction paths for how to make decisions, what to to trust. How do you do this? How do you actually get an energy efficiency project through your organization? And how do you know that, you're de that it's delivering the savings that you want it to deliver? And I think that's the piece of this that is hard for everybody right now. Is it an apples to apples comparison? Do we know what we're getting? How do we trust this market? What is the market delivering? And how do you, how do you, how do you engage in a way that um, where you know what you're starting with in terms of the criteria of what you're trying to achieve and you know you've achieved them at the end of the day. And I think that's the piece of sustainability that we are all in these markets trying to figure out, which is how, are, what are, how do we set our goals, how do we get there, and what are we learning along the way, and how do we manage 
the fact that there are ups and downs, there are unexpected uh, discontinuities in those markets. I think that ends on, a good, on an interesting note. Um, I thank all three of our panelists, Rick, Jennifer, and Linda, and um, we're probably well past time for the next one. <laughs>